Thank you, Bob. As he indicated, today we are giving you a respite from discussions of American politics. And uh, the size of the audience suggests that it might even be described as a welcome respite. Um, Britain and the European Union are in negotiations, you all know this, over Britain's withdrawal from the EU. Uh, while the UK did not originally sign the Treaty of Rome, it has actually been a member of the European community for 44 years. Uh, the negotiations came about as a result of the referendum last year and by uh, steps to uh, make it happen by the, uh, the government, the conservative government of Theresa May. Uh, Brexit is a huge leap for Britain, our speaker will tell us, and important to the EU as well. It has major implications for trade. Uh, immigration and labor mobility, it has been, uh, Europe has had open borders, uh, centers of business, and many, many political matters. Our speaker today, Douglas Alexander, will help us understand Brexit, its current status, the implications for Britain, the European Union, as well as for the United States, because it does have an effect. He has phenomenal qualifications for this seminar and for this task. He served 18 years as a member of parliament, including nine years as a minister or cabinet member uh, under the Labor Party. After the conservatives uh, took power, he served as the Labor Party's shadow foreign secretary and therefore its spokesman on uh, most international matters from 2011 to 2015. He is a private citizen. He is a very busy private citizen. He has academic ties to the Kennedy School, to King's College London, and to Oxford University. He's a member of the Privy Council of the United Kingdom, and also the uh, European uh, Council of Foreign Relations, and holds other positions in law and business. Uh, he is even working with uh, U2 frontman Bono on investments in Africa. Uh, his alternative activity if he were not visiting us today, would be meeting today at the Elysee Palace with President Macron, Bono, and our speaker. So um, uh, we are very pleased that he decided to come here. Um, and, and we love this. He has graced our community by bringing his entire family his wife Jacqueline, Douglas Jr., and Eve to spend a few days here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm steamboat welcome to the Right Honorable Douglas Alexander. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, let me thank Gary for that warm and generous introduction. And it would be remiss of me this evening to do anything other than to begin by thanking Bob Stein, the seminar's chairman, Bell, and the organizing committee of these seminars, tonight's sponsors, without whom this evening would not be possible, and indeed that wider Steamboat Springs community so well represented here this evening, for making Jackie and Douglas and Eve and myself so welcome in recent days. So far since we arrived what seems like a lifetime ago on Saturday afternoon, <laughs> we've attended a rodeo, we've <laughs> picnicked in the botanical gardens, we have tubed down the Yampa River. <laughs> we have hiked by Dumont Lake and Fish Creek, and we have even visited your wonderful library. It takes a lot to get my kids in a library. But in all seriousness, this is clearly a very special place and a special community, and we are honored to be here with you this evening. Now, I have to admit that I find the prospect of addressing steamboat citizens, given that you have so many impressive qualifications, not least the number of Winter Olympians amongst you, just a little intimidating. But whenever I find myself intimidated before speaking to an audience, I remember a story that my father told me. My father has been for more than 40 years a minister, a pastor in the Church of Scotland. 
And he tells the story of one of his friends who was also a minister in the Church of Scotland who was officiating at a wedding ceremony one day in Glasgow when to his complete horror, he realized he had forgotten the name of the couple he was supposed to be about to be marrying. <laughs> but because this friend of my father's had many decades of experience in the ministry by this point, by the end of the final verse of the first hymn, he had come up with a cunning plan. And at the conclusion of the final verse of the first hymn, he drew himself up to his full six feet and in his most sonorous Presbyterian voice addressed the bridegroom. He said, in what name do you present yourself for marriage this day? And back came the reply in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these days, as Gary has already mentioned, I'm a fairly regular visitor to your great country as a result of my work as a senior fellow at Harvard University. Yet Harvard was not my first academic association on this side of the Atlantic. It was back in 1988 that I won a scholarship that allowed me to spend a year studying at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. What an extraordinary opportunity that was, for which I am still grateful so many years later. And recollecting that wonderful city, and indeed that wonderful year, reminds me that it is now more than 300 years ago, in 1693, that the Quaker founder of Pennsylvania, William Penn, made the case for a European diet or parliament as a means to try and end the apparently endless military conflicts across the European continent. Now, as John Major, one of our former British prime ministers, observed recently with characteristic British understatement, it took 280 years and two world wars for William Penn to convince his fellow Britons of that case. So for the last 44 years, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has indeed been a member first of the European Economic Community and then its successor body, the European Union. This European Union, which it is worth recollecting as recently as 2012, won the Nobel Prize not only for its contribution to ensuring peace on a continent twice drenched in blood during the 20th century, but also for its contribution to the cause of democracy, free speech, and the rule of law. For let us for a moment just remember that when in the 1970s the United Kingdom joined the European economic community, the Iron Curtain still divided Europe between liberty and Soviet oppression, and in Western Europe, Spain and Portugal had yet to embrace democracy, while Greece had only just emerged from military rule. So the European Union has contributed not only to peace, but to the continent's embrace of democracy and prosperity. And right around the world, countries and regions today are following a similar path and choosing to come together. The reasons, to my mind, are pretty straightforward. Power and wealth are shifting east in what many are already describing as an Asian century. The population of India and China are both more than double that of the population of the European Union. Indeed, while British newspapers are filled with stories about the reach of Brussels, where the European Union is headquartered, it is actually the rise of Beijing that will be our generation's story of shifting global power. And as our former Prime Minister Tony Blair said recently, countries are banding together not in opposition to the rising powers, but in recognition of the geopolitical fact that they have risen. So in the Far East, ASEAN has gone from being an alliance somewhat sleepily developed to suddenly becoming an important priority for countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia, who realize that even all together, the ASEAN nations are half the size of their powerful neighbor to the north. In Latin America, it's the same with the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur. Some of this is driven by trade, of course, but it's also part of the adjustment of the power relationships in the new world. In this modern world, with countries the size of continents, 
Great powers have the capacity to dominate economically, politically, and militarily. So the case for integration to leverage collective power seems compelling. And yet, in the early hours of June the 24th last year, the British people made a fundamentally different choice. Rejecting the urgings of the British government, President Barack Obama, the Bank of England, the OECD, and the International Monetary Fund, amongst others, the British people voted in a referendum by a clear but narrow majority of 48% to 52% to leave the European Union. Brexit, as Britain's exit from the European Union has come to be known, is, in the words of Lionel Barber, the editor of the Financial Times, the biggest demerger in post-war history. Plenty of countries have joined the European Union, 28 to be precise, but none have actually left. We are sailing into uncharted territory. So in my remarks this evening, I aim to give you a sense as to why Europe, and indeed Britain's relationship with Europe, matters to the United States, before going on to explain why Britain made this historic choice and give you a sense of what may come next and the implication of these future paths. I have resisted the temptation to give you a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> because as Fareed Zakaria, who gives a lot of these talks, implores speakers, never give a PowerPoint presentation. Because as he puts it, people who have PowerPoint presentations never have any power and rarely have a point. <laughs> now, Transatlantic relations have mattered to the United States for as long as this great nation has existed. Indeed, in the 18th century, at the time of the War of Independence, George Washington, then of course the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, secured significant military support and financial and diplomatic assistance for the American cause from inevitably Britain's oldest continental adversary, that being France. Indeed, as recently as just last week, at the Bastille Day celebrations in Paris, the presence of President Trump acknowledged the key role played by the Marquis de Lafayette in both the American and French revolutions. But let's fast forward to transatlantic relations today and why Europe continues to matter, I believe so profoundly, to the United States. For 70 years, really since the end of the Second World War, America has, in the words of Princeton's John Eikenbury, been the system operator of an international order built on a strong and stable transatlantic alliance, supported by the twin pillars of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the European Union. Indeed, at the time of the Brexit referendum in June of 2016, then President Obama recognized the strength of that transatlantic alliance declaring that it has made the world safer and more prosperous. And the importance of that Western unity has only been underlined by the fraying of the international order that we have all witnessed in recent years. The conflict and turmoil in the Middle East is perhaps the clearest example of that weakening of that order. Yet further east in the Pacific, history is today being forged as China seeks dominance not only in the South China Sea, but also in the Western Pacific. At the same time, a revanchist Russia is seeking to re-establish equivalence with the United States within the international system, with low oil prices and heightening economic and political pressure on the Kremlin, few can, nor should, discount the possibility of further Russian aggression in the years ahead. It is therefore little wonder that just last year, NATO's military commander in Europe, General Philip Breedlove, warned that Russia is intentionally creating a refugee crisis to overwhelm and break Europe. Today, inter internal pressure, both economic and nationalist in character, is combining with those external crises of security and migration to put the European Union under quite unprecedented strain. It was, of course, back in 1989 that a wall that divided Europe came down. Yet in 2016 and 2017, in the face of this migration crisis, barbed wire fences that divide Europe 
are going back up. No one knows how far the fragmentation will reach or how this current crisis will end. But the bright and optimistic vision of a Europe whole and free that was set out by President George w. H. W. Bush at the end of the Cold War is fading fast on the continent. And it should surely be of concern to all of us that Donald Tusk, the President of the European Council, has recently compared these times in Europe to the day before World War I, when decades of prosperity disintegrated into darkness. Yet for all of these present worries, the 27 members of the European Union who are NATO members remain the largest grouping of US allies anywhere in the world. These NATO allies fought alongside the United States in Afghanistan for more than a decade after the terrible events of 9-11. The US campaign against Islamic State today benefits from both British and French military support. And European NATO members are on the front line of opposing Putin's expansionist ambitions on Europe's eastern border. As my friend and colleague, Professor Nick Burns at Harvard's Belfer Center describes it, on nearly every important issue and every important US global priority, Europe is a key partner of the United States. So if it's clear that Europe is, in this 21st century, still significant to the United States security, how important these days is Europe to the United States' prosperity? Dr. Daniel Hamilton of the Center for Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins University recently gave powerful testimony before the US House of Representatives, and the evidence he produced of Europe's continued importance to American prosperity is quite striking. Despite all of the hype about rising powers and emerging markets, Europe remains the most important commercial market in the world for the United States and the major geoeconomic base for US companies operating abroad. None of America's other commercial arteries are as integrated with the US economy. The $5.5 trillion transatlantic economy is the fulcrum of today's global economy, generating 15 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Europe remains America's largest trading partner, greatest source of foreign investment, and largest source of onshored jobs. Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Florida each export eight times more to Europe than to China. New York exports seven times more to Europe than to China. Indiana exports seven times more to Europe than China. Texas exports three times more to Europe than to China. And California on the western coast exports twice as much still to Europe than to China. Indeed, US companies invest twice as much in Europe as in all of the Asia Pacific region combined. In 2016, last year, Europe accounted for an estimated 72% of all investment flowing into the United States from foreign shores. Europe invests four times as much in America as Asia. On inward investment, I'm proud to say the United Kingdom leads the way with $493 billion invested in 2015, but Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, and France together invested $1.255 trillion here in the United States. That reflects the strategy of European firms to be inside the United States, the world's largest and most dynamic market. So if it is clear that around the world, regions are coming together economically, politically, and militarily, and it's equally clear that Europe remains central in the 21st century to the United States security and prosperity, let us now consider what explains the decision of the people of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union just last year. It was back in January of 2013 that the then British Prime Minister David Cameron made the fateful decision to include a commitment in his own party, the Conservative Party's election manifesto for the 2015 general election in the United Kingdom to hold an in-out referendum on the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union. That decision ended and will forever define David Cameron's premiership. Yet it is almost hard to comprehend how minor were the issues 
that led to this decision, given how major were its effects and its consequences. At the time, David Cameron perceived himself to be under internal political pressure within his own party from largely Eurosceptic conservative backbenchers hostile to Britain's membership of the European Union. At the same time, he fell under external electoral pressure from the UK Independence Party, a populist right-wing anti-European party that had long campaigned for an in-out referendum. There was little evidence of any overwhelming public demand for a referendum, but in a fateful misjudgment, Cameron elevated essentially an exercise in party management to a matter of government policy. When rather to his own surprise, in the subsequent general election in May 2015, Cameron's Conservative Party won a majority in the House of Commons, the British Prime Minister had little choice but to deliver on his referendum manifesto pledge. So in the months following that election, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, sought with frankly very little success to renegotiate Britain's terms of membership so as to be able to offer a reformed relationship to the British people when the referendum was held. Now, as a former minister for Europe during the past UK presidency of the European Union, I observe that perhaps the single most important quality for negotiations in the European Council, where the 28 heads of government meet, is empathy, a sense that you understand and have concern for the needs of your fellow leaders. But in the autumn of 2015, when David Cameron was seeking to undertake those renegotiations, those European leaders were simultaneously dealing with the challenges of security, of a weak level of economic growth across the Eurozone, and the migra migration crisis of which I have spoken. And they had frankly little interest in helping a British Prime Minister who, in the words of a former European Commission President, Jose Manuel Barroso, brought the problems of the Conservative Party to the door of Europe. There's an additional point that is relevant here. For many decades, the United Kingdom's attitude to the European Union has been characterized by pragmatism rather than idealism, partly for reasons of geography as an island nation, but even more for reasons of history, given Britain was last invaded in 1066 and since then has developed a stable democracy that has endured through conflict and crisis, the United Kingdom has maintained a certain detachment towards Europe even during those 44 years of membership. And this detachment perhaps captured best in the apocryphal Times of London headline, Fog in the Channel, Continent Cut Off, has in recent decades curdled into a public discourse driven in large part by Britain's tabloid newspapers that actively disdained Europe and equated the European Union not with peace and prosperity, but with meddlesome and burdensome regulations affecting too many aspects of British lives. So to try and win a referendum on British membership of the European Union against this backdrop was always going to be difficult. Yet the immediate backdrop to the referendum campaign in the summer of 2016 was the backdrop of two other discrete but related in the minds of the British public crises that merit consideration. Firstly, the longest period of wage stagnation in the United Kingdom since the 19th century. Similarly to many parts of the United States, a coming together of trade, technology and liberalization have seen wages stall and many local communities stagnate. In a recent speech, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, the UK's central bank, warned that the United Kingdom is today suffering its first lost decade since the 1860s in terms of wage growth. In the United Kingdom today, in our labor market, we are thankfully witnessing a jobs miracle, but we are sadly suffering a pay disaster. Governor Carney went on to assert that the rising tide of globalization does not lift all boats. It favors the famous and the fortunate, not the frustrated and the frightened. So the economic backdrop to the 2016 referendum was pessimism and frustration, not confidence and optimism. 
And as the former Harvard president and director of the National Economic Council, Larry Summers, has described it, weak economics makes for angry politics. At the same time, as I've alluded to, the European continent has faced the most serious refugee and migration crisis since the 1940s. The movement of refugees, not simply from Syria, but also from North Africa and even Afghanistan via the failed state of Libya, has presented an almost existential challenge to the European Union. The cultural anxiety that these twin crises have precipitated have only been amplified by outbreak of terrorist attacks affecting Belgium, France, Germany, and then more recently, the United Kingdom. The 2016 Brexit referendum campaign against this backdrop witnessed a titanic battle in which Leave campaigners warned entirely falsely that Turkey would probably join the European Union by 2020, and equally falsely that Britain's membership dues of the European Union would be recycled 350 million pounds a week directly into Britain's National Health Service. At the same time, Remain campaigners warned of the costs of departure in the hope that those warnings would be sufficient to secure the status quo. As Gary mentioned in the introduction, I've been directly involved as a candidate and as an active citizen in democratic contests for 30 years in the United Kingdom. But I honestly cannot remember a campaign where so many people made statements they knew to be untrue, apparently without any penalty, as the Brexit referendum. <laughs> Even before the result was announced, it was clear that post-truth politics had made a major advance in the United Kingdom. It turned out in the early hours of June the 24th, 2016, that contrary to many people's expectations, a narrow but clear majority of the British public accepted the Leave campaign's principal offer, in the words of their compelling campaign slogan, to take back control. The vote reflected a sense of economic anger, cultural anxiety, and political alienation. This was not simply a rejection of the European Union, but also a rejection of experts, the establishment, the status quo, and politics as usual. The result of the referendum, a narrow victory for leave by just 4%, has, in the words of one former British Prime Minister, been simply one of the most divisive votes in British history. It not only divided the four nations of our United Kingdom, but opened up divisions within those nations, within political parties, within neighborhoods, within families, between age and income groups, and among friends. It will not be easy to heal those divisions or unite our nations. After decades of campaigning, the anti-European campaigners, the so-called Eurosceptics, have won their battle to take Britain out of Europe. In the hours following the referendum, in favour of leaving the EU, the Prime Minister David Cameron tendered his resignation with immediate effect. He had gambled and he had lost. He was replaced as Prime Minister by Theresa May, a Conservative cabinet member who had herself supported the United Kingdom staying in the, in the European Union, albeit rather half-heartedly. She was known as a rhino, a Remainer in name only. <laughs> in no small part, due to her need to solidify her position, therefore, within a predominantly Leave-supporting Conservative Party, the new Prime Minister has spent most of the last year advocating what has come to be known as hard Brexit. She has interpreted the instruction of the British people on June the 23rd of 2016 as being to take back control of Britain's money, of Britain's borders, and of Britain's laws. To the significant dismay of most of the business community, Theresa May's government has advocated Britain's departure, not simply from the European single market, itself ironically a British creation, and the European Customs Union, the largest trading bloc in the world. And then, on March the 29th this year, the British government triggered what is called the Article 50 process, the as yet untested mechanism by which a member state leaves the European Union. 
Article 50 is contained within the Lisbon Treaty of European Law and sets out an automatic two-year timetable for automatic exit, so quite literally the clock is now ticking on Britain's departure. Hoping to secure a large parliamentary majority and consequently strengthen her hand in those upcoming Article 50 negotiations across Europe, in April of this year, Theresa May called a snap an unanticipated general election in the United Kingdom. And on June the 8th, this decision was revealed as a quite catastrophic misjudgment. Far from gaining a larger parliamentary majority at home and enhanced authority abroad, the election delivered no overall majority at home and shredded the Prime Minister's authority abroad. If that seems quite a lot to try and take in in just a few paragraphs, let me just quote from a column written earlier this month by the esteemed Financial Times writer Martin Wolfe, which summarises the almost surreal series of events we've lived through in the United Kingdom over just the last 18 months. He writes, and I quote directly, the United Kingdom once had a deserved reputation for pragmatic and stable politics. That will not survive the spectacular mess it is making of Brexit. Remember what has happened. In an unnecessary referendum, a small majority chose an option they could not understand because it had not been worked out. Thereupon, a new prime minister, with no knowledge of the complexities, adopted the hardest possible interpretation of the outcome. She triggered the exit process in March of 2017 before shaping a detailed negotiating position. Some 70 days later, in an unnecessary election, she lost both her majority and her authority. So in truth, these are difficult days in the United Kingdom. The effects of political stasis are already being felt. This time last year, if modesty will forgive, the United Kingdom was the fastest growing economy in the G7. We are now the slowest. Incomes are stagnating and the savings rate is at its lowest rate for 50 years. So what then is the way ahead? There are a number of possible scenarios as to what will emerge between now and Britain's anticipated departure from the European Union in the spring of 2019. It is a perfectly credible scenario that no divorce agreement is actually reached during the negotiations between the United Kingdom and the European Union with the result that tariffs would be imposed, trading arrangements would default to World Trade Organization rules, and major disruption to business would be all but inevitable. It is also possible, although as a former UK Trade Minister, I would judge it highly unlikely, that within just the next 18 months, the United Kingdom and the European Union would sign a bold and comprehensive trade deal covering all aspects of goods and services trade. Generally, such agreements take many years and the likelihood of agreement on such a tight and constrained timescale is frankly very remote. It seems to me a more plausible and likely scenario, if the political will exists on both sides of the channel, is a more limited agreement involving a longer transitional phase in order to maintain trading relationships and avoid a legal and regulatory cliff edge while resolving all of the relevant matters in a longer period of time between the United Kingdom and the European Union. This is incidentally the scenario that is clearly most favored by the business community in the United Kingdom. Now there are many other scenarios which perhaps we can discuss during the question and answer session that follows these remarks. But after the experience of politics over recent years, I would frankly be brave if not foolhardy to make any predictions about the future whatsoever. Certainly, however, the road ahead will be both economically and politically bumpy for the United Kingdom. There are few easy answers available for the negotiators. Yet beneath all of the legal and commercial complexity of these negotiations that now consume acres of newsprint in Britain every day, actually sits a simple and as yet unanswered question. As the United Kingdom, what kind of country do we aspire to be in the 21st century? 
As Lionel Barber of the Financial Times has written, since the end of the Cold War, many fine mine, minds have tried to conceptualize the United Kingdom's place in the world. Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister, described Britain as a transatlantic bridge, which worked well until Iraq, when the United Kingdom sided with the United States against an anti-war coalition led by France, Germany, and Russia. David Miliband, a good friend of mine, the former British Foreign Secretary, cast Britain as a global hub, a magnet for commerce, for culture, for education and finance. And most recently, David Cameron talked about the United Kingdom as an island nation adapting to a new networked world. The United Kingdom today undoubtedly retains immense strengths, an economy powered by world-class universities, world-class cultural institutions, world-class creative industries, and world-class cities, including but not limited to the great city of London. A society characterized by resilience and growing diversity, intelligence agencies and military capability recognized globally, and the soft power appeal of a country that has given the world the internet, the music of the Beatles, and of football, or should I say soccer, of the English Premiership. So Brexit actually confronts the United Kingdom with a pretty stark choice. Do we now retreat into a little England of isolationist mediocrity, or do we look outwards and embrace the opportunities and, yes, the responsibilities of our interdependent world? I know the choice that I think makes sense for my country. In the 19th century, in the era of empire, Britain enjoyed splendid isolation, focused on colonies rather than the continent. But in the 21st century, in an era defined by interdependence, there is nothing splendid about isolation. Indeed, consider for just a moment the big challenges that as a world we face. How do we resolve the challenge of climate change? How do we ensure a more stable but still dynamic global economy? How do we sustain the extraordinary progress in eradicating disease and improving global health? How do we sustain Western values in the face of so many new challenges? Every one of these challenges, I would contend, can be met more effectively by nations working together rather than working alone. Our world is more interdependent than ever. Now, of course, a strong, open United Kingdom that retains a close partnership with Europe cannot solve each of these problems, but we can play our part economically, politically, and strategically, making the case for a reinvigorated global politics of the common good. The United Kingdom today stands at a crossroads. My sincere hope is that, as in the past, we choose the road of engagement over detachment, of cooperation over conflict, and internationalism over isolationism. And I believe it is profoundly in the interests of the United States that we make that enlightened choice. For that is our opportunity, that is our responsibility, and I believe working together, it can still be our achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you, is this on? Thank you very much. And uh, you, you did not speak of Scotland and, and their independence tendencies, nor of Ireland, which changes because the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will become quite different. I'm always happy to speak about Scotland, not least as a proud and patriotic Scot. Um, in some ways, independence is the dog that has not barked after the Brexit vote, because I was heavily committed in an extraordinary and significant referendum in Scotland back in 2014, which asked the question, should Scotland leave the United Kingdom and establish itself as a separate state, or should it stay within the family of the United Kingdom? I have an interest to declare I was a very prominent campaigner for Scotland to stay within the United Kingdom. 
but by a vote of 45% to 55%, Scotland chose to stay within the United Kingdom. But as a result of the disappointment felt by many of the 45% who voted to leave the United Kingdom, support for the nationalist cause surged after the referendum. They never secured a majority of more than 50%, but they wiped out the Scottish Labour Party and pretty much the Scottish Conservative Party in the general election of 2015. If in a first-past-the-post system you win 45% of the vote, you pretty much win every seat, which is what they did. So the expectation when the Brexit vote happened was that this would lead to a huge surge in support for independence. And as a consequence of that, Nicola Sturgeon, the leader of the Nationalist Party and First Minister of Scotland, declared that Brexit represented an event that demanded a second referendum on Scottish independence. During the first independence referendum, just 20 months previously, she had said this would be a once-in-a-generation referendum. But a generation got rather concertinaed to just 20 months. We then had the general election of which I spoke, and to the surprise of the nationalists, their support hemorrhaged rapidly. They lost seats in the north of Scotland, in the south of Scotland, in the east of Scotland, and in the west of Scotland. So we're in a rather curious position now where you have the government of Scotland committed to an independence referendum, but conscious that if it actually calls the independence referendum, it will lose. So deciding to put independence on the back burner, at the same time as many people predicted, Scotland would choose to join the European Union as an independent state rather than stay part of a post-Brexit United Kingdom. I personally think Scotland's future within the United Kingdom is relatively secure, not least economically, because the British single market is worth four times as much to Scottish exporters as the European single market. We've been an integrated economy for 300 years, but also because I think so profound are the difficulties that Brexit is revealing that many people are now thinking, would we really want to go through that in establishing a separate state in Scotland? So that's where things stand in Scotland. In Northern Ireland, there are profound difficulties being caused as a result of the Brexit vote. Northern Ireland voting to um, remain within the European Union, as Scotland did, by a clear majority, partly because so many people in Northern Ireland have come to value the borderless trade established under the Good Friday Agreement and the porous border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And there is a profound fear that that common trade and invisible border facilitated in no small part by both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom being both within the European Union will now give way for a hard border because the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland after Brexit will represent the external border of the European Union. And so a great deal of concern and thought is now being given to how could we have a common travel area whereby you can still have free movement between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland because in pretty much everybody's view within Northern Ireland, if we see the re-establishment of a hard border with border controls, it will represent a significant regression and indeed a significant threat to the peace process that has been one of the most proud achievements of the north and south of Ireland over the last 20 years. Thank you. Is, given all of the uncertainty, is there a realistic possibility or realistic scenarios that Brexit will not happen? Um, Literally every day that you read a British newspaper, you will get a different point of view on exactly that question. My own view is, however much, and I would have wanted Britain to stay within the European Union, so profound was the debate around the Brexit referendum that it is inherently difficult for Remain supporters to now say, well, we didn't really like the result in 2016, so let's have a different referendum in 2018. You know, are we going to end up with the best of three or the best of five? <laughs> you end up in a never-endum rather than a referendum in those circumstances. And I think in that sense, there's been a degree of um, grief amongst the 48% that has played out in some people saying, let's have an immediate second referendum. All of that being said, 
I think as the facts emerge in terms of the economic, legal, and political complexity, it's not unreasonable for the people of the United Kingdom to reconsider their position. But I think if one of the drivers of that vote, the 52%, was a, and I use this word advisedly, the hatred of politics as usual, the political class, and the establishment, if that result is not seen to be honored, we will see an even greater surge in populist parties defining themselves in opposition to mainstream politics. So I think a more realistic objective than an immediate second referendum would actually be to try and ensure a close and effective partnership, if not membership, with the European Union for the years ahead, reserving, of course, in the future the possibility that if the British people so choose, that close partnership could be translated into membership. But it seems to me to be the work of years rather than the work of weeks or months. Thank you. Dean. As we, as we look at the British economy, uh, we are very impressed with the strength of the financial sector. Mm -hmm. and, but realistically, many of the professionals working in the financial sector and elsewhere come from the continent. And, and it has benefited from English as the language of Europe, and it has benefited from a historic center of that. What, what are the challenges that it faces, the financial sector, the city in London? Well, one of the principal benefits for the financial services sector, which is thought of by many people as being exclusively rich bankers in the square mile of the city of London, now, there are a number of very rich bankers in the square mile of the city of London, but there are hundreds of thousands of people employed in financial services, not just in London, but in Leeds and Edinburgh, in Cardiff, in Belfast, right across the United Kingdom. One of the principal benefits of European Union membership is what's called passporting. And that essentially means if you meet the regulatory threshold set in any one of the 28 members of the European Union, you're able to sell and trade your services in any one of the other 27 members of the European Union. So that is an incredibly valuable piece of paper for any financial services company selling retail products across, what, 500 million consumers across Europe. It is already clear that one of the consequences of Britain's exit from the European Union is the removal of passporting rights for British financial services companies, or indeed, American banks based in the UK who have historically seen London as the bridge into that European market. So what you are already seeing are a number of major institutions choosing to secure banking licenses in other countries. Dublin is already benefiting from the relocation of significant numbers of financial services companies and jobs. The law firm who I work with are opening an office in Dublin in order to facilitate people being able to ensure that they have access to the, not just Irish market, but the European market. And in that sense, there are going to be significant changes to the financial services sector. There is quite a degree of anxiety within the city of London that New York and American banks in particular are going to be the principal beneficiaries of the changes to the financial regulatory regime. Because you've had banks like Barclays who are headquartered both in the UK, but trade a lot in the United States, who have been able to compete effectively with global institutions based in New York. There is real concern that we will see European banking consolidate into being a regional banking center rather than a global banking sector. So whether it is in Euro clearing, whether it is in rights of passporting, whether it is simply the attractiveness of international staff coming and basing themselves in London, financial services are facing very significant challenges as a result of Brexit. Good. Uh, it would seem that the economic and even political relationships between British Britain and the United States is, is going to become more important. Uh, what advice would you give the British government in terms of approaches to what is possibly becoming a more difficult America to deal with? Really? And I see that, <laughs> and I see that uh, your that. trade secretary, Liam Fox, is, I think, on his way here to, to talk about trade. Yep. The difficulty for Liam Fox, Liam Fox is a member of the British Cabinet who was appointed by Theresa May as the first international trade secretary of the United Kingdom. 
And you would think that's a fairly straightforward job after Brexit. You go around the world trying to replicate the 50 or so free trade agreements that the European Union has signed with other countries around the world. The only difficulty is he is constrained by the rules of the World Trade Organization, which says for as long as Britain remains within the common customs union of and the tariff barrier that that imposes of the European Union, no member within that customs union is allowed to conclude free trade agreements with third parties. So actually, Liam Fox, you're right, is on his way to the United Kingdom, but it's slightly awkward, to the United States, it's slightly awkward when he arrives because he's not in a position to conclude any agreements until at least the spring of 2019. Now, prior discussions can take place, but at the moment, Liam Fox is spending his time jetting around the world, promising that in time there'll be great deals to do with the United Kingdom. <laughs> One of the central myths, I would argue, that was perpetrated by Liam Fox, who was a very prominent Leave campaigner, or his colleague in the Leave campaign, Boris Johnson, who's now the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, was that Britain would stand taller in Washington DC, or in Moscow, or in Beijing, outside of the European Union. And actually, that thesis is about to be tested, and I'm somewhat fearful of the result. Because in reality, I've always believed Europe is a economic force multiplier for the United Kingdom. The fact that we were not just a member of the Security Council, a member of the Commonwealth, a member of NATO, but also critically, a member of the world's largest trading bloc actually made Britain more relevant in its discussions with the United States. So we're in a position now where the European economy is recovering. If you look at French, German and um, even Southern European rates of growth, they are beginning to tick upwards. So the degree of economic confidence in Europe is rising. At the same time, the election of Emmanuel Macron and the anticipated re-election of Angela Merkel is leading political confidence to rise within Europe. Britain is at a point where the Europeans are thinking, well, fine, you've made your choice and now we're going to negotiate in a way that is advantageous to Europe rather than to the United Kingdom. We are facing a president in the United States who said the hallmark of America first is to drive a very tough bargain in relation to trade negotiations. So in that sense, Britain is looking at what, in my experience as a previous trade minister, are a pretty unsentimental group of trade negotiators, whether in the United States or in other third party countries. And in that sense, I read the piece that um, Liam Fox published in the Wall Street Journal today. And as a British citizen, I hope he's right in his optimism as to the capacity for a deal to be done. But my experience of trade negotiations is that pretty unsentimental men and women drive pretty tough bargains in what they judge to be their national interest. The one additional point I would make would be, whether fairly or unfairly, Donald Trump genuinely believes he would not have been elected President of the United States but for the Brexit vote the previous year in the United Kingdom, or the previous three months in the United Kingdom in 2016. He believes that that gave confidence to people to vote against the status quo and the establishment, in his mind embodied in the Hillary Clinton campaign. And in that sense, he has given a very high level of access, both to Nigel Farage, one of the leaders of the UK Independence Party that I mentioned, who flew to meet him in Trump Tower after his election, and subsequently to Boris Johnson and to Theresa May, who went to meet with Donald Trump and indeed meet with the Republican leadership at their retreat in Philadelphia shortly after she became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So you could argue that his sense of political debt to those who delivered Brexit may shape the trade negotiations. Personally, I have my doubts, but we shall find out in the months ahead. Well, I I was going to ask, I was going to label this a completely unfair question, but you actually raised the subject, so it's only somewhat unfair, <laughs> to be followed by others that are completely unfair. Um, would you draw parallels between the Brexit vote and the uh, Trump's populist campaign of Make America Great Again? Are they um, too, are, Truthfully, are they, I'm conscious there'll be a, a wide range of opinions represented in the room. I do, and let me explain why. If you think of the slogan that was on the side of the bus in the British Brexit campaign on the Leave side, 
it was take back control. If you think of the most popular phrase of the Trump presidential campaign, it was make America great again. I would argue that the two most important words in those phrases are respectively back and again. Both campaigns were offering not a better tomorrow, but a better yesterday, and understood the power of nostalgia in contemporary politics. And let me explain what I mean, because it's not a partisan point. I think if you want to make sense both of the Brexit campaign and of the Trump campaign, there are three factors, to my mind, you need to weigh in the balance. One is economic anger. I don't think it is possible to understand how politics has developed on either side of the Atlantic without reference to the global financial crisis. I personally think that 2007, 2008 will be one of those years, perhaps like 1945, perhaps like 1789, when people's sense of how the world work shifts. And it's hard to overstate the extent to which the global financial crisis trashed the public's confidence in the powerful, whether in bankers, whether in regulators, whether in elected politicians. And if millions of people on both sides of the Atlantic had to deal with negative equity and the loss of value in their homes or in their savings, if people have dealt with the wage stagnation that I described as a direct consequence in the United Kingdom, if eight million people lost their job here in the United States, I don't think we should be surprised that economic anger are one of the factors driving politics on both sides of the Atlantic. So if there is economic anger that we share in common, I think a second feature is profound cultural anxiety. You know, America's losing more jobs to microchips than to Mexicans. But right now, we have politicians who are winning with a politics of anger more than a politics of answers. And that's exactly the same in the United Kingdom. Why did immigration feature so prominently in the Leave campaign on the Brexit debate on the uh, election on the, the referendum on the 23rd of June last year? It is because on both sides of the Atlantic, people have a profound sense that their country and their communities are changing at a speed and in ways that they did not anticipate and they weren't consulted about before those changes happened. And in that sense, politicians have been able to channel that sense of cultural anxiety towards hostility towards others. So it might be Muslims and Mexicans here in the United States, according to the Trump campaign. It might be Eastern Europeans, according to some of the Leave campaigners in the United Kingdom. But it's a easy and apparently effective strategy for politicians seeking to win favor to say, listen, if it wasn't for them, everything that we do would be fine. And in that sense, I think one of the ways we need to think about Brexit is not simply a crisis of money, economic anger, but also a crisis of meaning. One of the great ironies of the Brexit vote in Britain was the communities that registered the greatest hostility to migration were the communities with the lowest level of inward migration. So a global city like London that has benefited from a very high level of inward migration over recent decades voted overwhelmingly to remain within the European Union. Some of the post-industrial towns in the north of England with very low levels of inward migration voted overwhelmingly to close Britain's borders to the free movement of workers that have been part of the European Union for many years. So I think we need to think about cultural anxiety as well as economic anger. And I think the third element is political alienation. People have a deep and abiding antipathy towards politics as usual. And the Leave side in the Brexit referendum were able to say, literally, in the words of Michael Gove, now a cabinet member, and previously a prominent Leave campaign, this country has had enough of experts. What an extraordinary statement. <laughs> For a country that prides itself on its world-class universities, its commitment to the Scottish Enlightenment, the idea that evidence should be discarded in favor of emotion is something entirely new in the British political discourse, but it's real and it's powerful. And at the same time, 
I don't think Donald Trump would have been elected president if he hadn't been able to say, everybody in Washington is stupid. I know how to do deals. It's an extraordinary thing if you think about it. A billionaire property, or apparently a billionaire property developer from New York, able to persuade very significant number of blue collar Americans that actually he understood and shared their economic interests. I don't think you could explain that other than the antipathy, the toxicity that had developed towards politics as usual for many years before Trump arrived on the scene. And I think therefore there are striking similarities that combine economic anger, cultural anxiety, and political alienation. Good, uh, this is a... We have a very empathetic audience, and so I will read this question. Uh, how does Brexit affect the retired British people living in Europe, Spain, Portugal, et cetera, as far as Medi-Cal, Medicare, et cetera, works? Well, again, one of the great ironies of the debate about inward migration, which featured very prominently in the Brexit campaign, was the almost willful denial that in the European Union, immigration has always been a two-way street. We have more, a higher proportion of British citizens live abroad permanently than any other advanced economy. A significant number of them enjoying the benefits of wonderful Spanish weather or indeed other benefits to living in the south of France. But in that sense, there has always been a two-way flow of migration within the European Union. And so one of the immediate consequences and questions that have been asked since June the 23rd is what happens to the EU citizens living within the United Kingdom. There are about 400,000 French citizens living in London now. So if you are now President Macron or previously um, President Hollande or President Sarkozy, you always come to London to campaign because so many French voters are now registered in London. Um, we've got a big issue in terms of what happens to EU citizens who have made their life in the United Kingdom and what happens to those retired British citizens who have made their life elsewhere in the European Union. Frankly, I think that will be one of the easiest questions to answer in the negotiations, the Article 50 negotiations now underway, because frankly, it is massively in Britain's interest that the European Union guarantee the continued ability for people to be able to claim their equivalent of Medicare and Medicaid and, and um, their pension payments while living in the rest of the European Union. And it's significantly to Britain's economic benefit that those European citizens who have made their life in Britain are given guarantees as to their right to stay in the United Kingdom. So there is a high level of anxiety, but honestly, I would put it in the somewhat easier to deal with category than some of the other issues that are already emerging in the negotiations. Uh, we have a, a three card question on Russia, which I will summarize a little bit. Um, you suggest that Russia, in, in addition to attempting to uh, increase influence once again in the countries that were formerly in the Soviet bloc, also intends to disrupt Europe and other countries via the mass migrations from Southwest Asia, uh, Syria, and other countries like that. It, are, are these linked? And are these linked, or was any, uh, was any Russian evidence of Russian intent to affect the Brexit vote itself? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious this is a somewhat live discussion in the United States. Um, <laughs> there have been studies suggesting that if you watched Russia Today, something I can claim not to have been a great aficionado of, there were like, I think, four times as many Leave supporters shown on Russia Today as Remain supporters. But I'll leave that to others to judge. There's been no serious allegations, unlike here in the United States, that Russia hacked the Brexit result. Although I think it's fair to observe that the only two leaders I can think of who would have been celebrating the leave vote outside of the United Kingdom were the leaders of North Korea and the leaders of Russia. You know, literally every friend and ally of the United Kingdom that you can think of, including the European Union, including NATO members, including the United States, including Canada, all argued that it was in their national interest that Britain stayed within the European Union. And in that sense, why do I make that claim in relation to President Putin? Because he is world class at seeking to divide Europe. So if an opportunity arises for Europe to divide against itself, 
Putin regards himself as a winner. Why does Putin regard himself as a winner? Because as the leader of a declining global power, I'm afraid he sees international relations in terms of a zero-sum game between the West and between Russia. And in that sense, declining powers are often more difficult to engage with than rising powers. If you look at China, it is gaining immeasurably from integrating into the international system of which the United States has been the system operator over 70 years. Russia feels that it is losing the equivalence that characterized the Cold War. So in that sense, Russia undoubtedly sees a weak and divided Europe as being in Russia's national interest. And it sees the Brexit decision as being a choice by Europe to divide against itself. Good. Here's a uh, bit of an in-your-face question. Um, there were, obviously, there were issues why 52% why were not happy with what was going on in their, their own country, socially and economically. Um, some of this is expressed against the political insider elite, in quotes. Um, what should, what should people at, at high levels of politics and influence do to try to win back the trust of the people? I think that's a very fair question. It's, it's not, listen, I was in the House of Commons for 18 years. That's not in my face. That's positively gentle compared with what I'm, <laughs> what I'm used to. Um, but in all seriousness, I think one of, the, one of the problems with referendums as a political instrument is that people often answer a different question than the question that's on the ballot paper. And I'm not undermining the integrity of the vote, and I'm not questioning people's right to choose to see a referendum in those terms. But I think what lies beneath that question is absolutely accurate, which is, for many people, Brexit was a vote against politics as usual, against big business, against an economic and social order that they felt didn't recognize them, didn't acknowledge them, and didn't give them a stake in the future. And as I tried to reflect in an earlier answer, I think there's two dimensions here. There is an economic dimension whereby too many people, I would argue both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, feel that the system is rigged against them. And that somehow um, there have been a decades long party by the elites who have enriched themselves at the cost of the hardworking majority. And at the same time, they felt culturally disrespected by the mores of society. So if you say to a former steel worker in Sunderland, which was the first result on the night of Brexit, well, listen, I'm terribly sorry that your steel mill has closed and those jobs are now being done in China, but you're just gonna have to retrain as a coder at the equivalent of your local community college, the 55-year-old non-college educated steel worker tends to hear that as a reproach rather than as an invitation. And a big part of the Brexit vote was about meaning as much as money. It was about respect. It was about saying, see me, recognize my community and my culture, and the political and economic system we have today does neither. And it was an opportunity for people to register that sense of grievance and anger. And again, I would argue that's common on both sides of the Atlantic, because for the last 30 or 40 years, I and many of us probably gathered in this room have had a story that we've been part of about how the world is changing. And it basically says trade, technology, and liberalization lifts all boats makes us all richer, and empowers us all. And whether that be through the examples of telephony or the internet, or whether that's through wages, we've looked for evidence that actually that rising tide lifts all boats. What we've seen in the Brexit vote, and I would argue in the Trump vote as well, is the emergence for the first time in decades of a profoundly different narrative about how the world works. And it says that combination of trade, technology, and liberalization enriches the few, but actually ensures that the wages of most of us stagnates and actively disempowers the many relative to the elites who have all the power. And what that creates is not a politics that we've grown up with in Europe, 
really since the French Revolution, a politics of left and right, communal and individual, it's actually an insider-outsider politics. And what the Brexit campaign was able to do was to say, we are the principled, authentic outsiders up against a bunch of inauthentic, unprincipled political insiders. And that, in large part, helped power them to a 52% vote. So I actually think you can have profound respect for the concerns and the anger that is felt across society while respectfully disagreeing with the direction or destination that's been chosen by those votes. And you also have to ask yourself, what level of political and economic anxiety and anger must people feel if they hear all of the economic evidence from, as I said, the Bank of England and the OECD and from all of the main political parties and from President Obama and everybody else, and they say, we just don't care. We really don't care. Our lives are sufficiently tough that if this is a way of us registering that we want change, we're going to take that opportunity. And that was in no small measure the driver of a lot of people voting for Brexit last June. Last question. Uh, Britain has um, received a lot of praise from outsiders and, and in Britain for not joining the euro and keeping the pound sterling and as, it, as one would look at the difficulties along the southern rim of Europe, uh, the ability to manage your own economy is much better. But was that failure to, to, to embrace the euro, was that a harbinger uh, that Britain was not really all in on the European project and is that a was that a early sign that there may be some of these difficulties coming? It's a question um, without an answer, but it's well, the last question. I, <laughs> well, I, I should probably declare an interest. I was a member of the government that decided not to join the euro, and that was essentially because we set a number of economic tests about convergence of the British economy and the eurozone that we weren't convinced were right for the United Kingdom. And in retrospect, I think we were vindicated in that judgment. We got some things wrong as a government, but I think we got that right. Essentially, the Eurozone was a political project that, that has been revealed as having significant economic difficulties. You know, it is a far from optimal currency area. You, know, you have a federal system here in the United States whereby federal dollars support your poorer states by a system of fiscal transfer. We had a situation in Europe with the Eurozone where we were creating a common monetary system but retaining entirely separate fiscal systems. And that has proved to be very difficult in terms of aligning levels of productivity and levels of growth across the Eurozone. So I think it was the right economic judgment. But I think it's fair to acknowledge, as the question implies, that it was a popular decision, not simply because of the economics, but because Britain has always, as I tried to suggest in my remarks, had a somewhat more detached view of its relationship with the European project than many European countries. And I think that reflects Britain's history. If you are in some of those post-authoritarian countries that I mentioned, countries like Spain after Franco or Portugal or Greece, you equate membership of the European Union with democracy. In Britain, we, we equate democracy with the Magna Carta. We don't feel we need to learn democracy from the European Parliament or the European Court of Justice. We come from a different political tradition. If you are Germany, then Europe has come to represent an extraordinary opportunity to transcend the tragedy of your recent history and become a modern European nation, if you like, sustained and supported by a different vision of yourself than historically has been the case for Germany. Again, a different political tradition. Um, Helmut Kohl's funeral just a couple of weeks ago was an extraordinary eloquent tribute to the post-war reimagining of Germany that the European Union represents. So in that sense, Britain's always had a more detached view of its relationship with Europe. But if you talk to fellow European leaders, one of the points they make about Brexit is you had the best of both worlds. You had all of the trade benefits without the political obligations inherent either in the Eurozone or the Schengen area. Why would you walk away from a construct that had been built in an image 
that allowed you to retain your distinctiveness. Tragically, I think there will be change within the European Union over coming years, much needed change, but in all likelihood that will be change that happens with Britain outside rather than inside, because whether it is the advent of the single market, whether it is much of the thinking in relation to a common security and defence policy, whether it is in relation to the establishment of the European External Action Service, Britain has been at the forefront of much of the most creative thinking about the European Union over recent decades. So I think that decision to avoid joining the euro back in the 1990s was the correct decision. It was economically wise, but it spoke to a division of consciousness uh, that I think endures to this day. For Europe, in, in the minds of British people, Europe is a thought. For many on the continent, Europe is a feeling. And Britain has ended up paying a very heavy price for seeing Europe in terms of a thought and not a feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you.